There we go. So in March of 2017, Senator Heather Staines and I uh, filed legislation jointly um, really to um, lay out a framework to build upon our existing medical distribution system uh, to tax and regulate cannabis similarly to alcohol. Unlike many states that have already moved into this space, we don't have the option to do it by, by a ballot referendum. Uh, we are not a binding referendum state. Uh, Michigan uh, is the most recent state to do it by ballot referendum, and in their November election, they legalized possession of up to two and a half ounces and 12 plants per household, um, so just by way of comparison. Um, and they are in the rulemaking process for, for their state, and that will they're, they are expected to go to market right around January of 2020. In the course of the last couple of years, we've had dozens of town halls, four public hearings uh, on subject matter, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of meetings with stakeholders, um, really with the shared objective of trying to craft the best possible uh, program for the state. So this is what what the state of the, the, the issue is in, in around the country. More than half of the U.S. population lives in a state where some form of sales are legal. Um, and as I said earlier, all the states where with adult use right now uh, did it by ballot initiative. Vermont uh, did full decriminalization, but they haven't started a marketplace yet. DC is the same way, um, which is a very strange hybrid that frankly in some ways seems worse than the status quo because what you have instead are these odd pop-ups uh, with completely unregulated uh, product and you're really empowering uh, the, the illegal marketplace there. And you have no guarantees that the product is tested or safe or any of those things. You have actual like cottage producers of infused products at some of these. Um, and you literally sign up for an email list and get an email about where the, they call them farmer's markets, where the farmer's market is going to be that week. So uh, that, that, uh, that's that been presented as a potential middle ground, and I actually think it's, it's uh, less safe. Um, so fundamentally, uh, the why for many of us is prohibition simply hasn't worked. Um, it is uh, really, you know, Public policy is widely ignored by you know, somewhere in the 100 million people nationwide and is used on a daily basis. Um, we are not addressing youth access with, under prohibition. Um, here in Illinois, uh, national studies have shown about 780,000 people respond to these, the, the, the SAMHSA national drug use study as being regular users of the product and what that means is at least monthly. Um, and so that's 780,000 regular users. Uh, our patient count in March was about 58,000 cards had been issued. That doesn't really mean 58,000 people are accessing the marketplace actually, because they don't take you off if you die. They don't take you off if you don't use your card. But just for the sake of argument, that means about 730,000 people are purchasing product on the illicit marketplace. It, what we've seen in other states when legalization comes into play is usage rates stay roughly the same. You see a slight decrease among youth and a slight increase, and the only um, place you see that increase is among people over 50, um, which I, I see the smirks, I do it too every time I talk about it. Um, this, is the, this is the demographic most familiar with the product, the demographic most likely to be law abiding, and the demographic with the sorest knees. So you know that tends to be why you see a slight increase there. So, but but the the decrease among youth and the increase, the slight increase among people over fifty, usage rates stay roughly the same. So I talked about youth access. I have never seen the guy who slings weed on the corner in my neighborhood card anyone. There are active street markets in my neighborhood. Youth know how to get access to this product. It's 87% of kids report that it's easier to access cannabis than alcohol. Um, so Heather and I both have kids in the same school, and they both have seniors in high school. And when we first introduced the bill, there were a lot of jokes about us being the coolest moms in the school. And then we started talking publicly about uh, cutting, on, cutting down on youth access, and we stopped being cool pretty quickly. Um, 
in, in every, almost every state that has legalized, you've seen youth use decline between a combination of being carted. Now, anybody who's ever, has anyone here? Well, I'm not gonna ask. Um, anybody who's ever been to a dispensary can tell you. Um, you go um, through at least two ID checks before you get anywhere near a product. You can't get in the front door, you can't get through the second door, and usually you also, your, your, your ID gets scanned again at, at the point of purchase. And it is, it is scanned uh, for, and verified for validity. Uh, which is more than we do for alcohol, frankly. Um, so, so that's that's one big piece of it. But also, and in, in in states that have some track record, they've actually learned and 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 adapted. Colorado has a really robust youth um, uh, prevention uh, deterrent program, an education program. And you know, I talk about this all the time. You know, we 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 expect kids to ace the AP Bio exam. And then when we want to talk to them about drug use, we put two eggs in a frying pan and say, this is your brain on drugs and expect them to respect us for that. You know, kids can understand neurotransmitters. They can understand addiction pathways. If we give them good information like we have around tobacco, like we have around littering, these things have, these things have been driven down in usage and, and participation because of robust public education. I actually spent two hours today talking about what the public education program would look like and, and what, we, what it would take to put into it to make it uh, really effective here. Um, and then, you know, fundamentally, uh, we, we do need to address the fact that the war on drugs has not just failed in terms of, you know, cutting into drug use, but it's really done harm to a lot of communities. And it's incumbent upon us, if we do this, to do it right and do it in a way that repairs a lot of the harm of the war on drugs. We've seen disproportionate uh, policing on this issue um, for decades. And you know, when we talk about uh, the impact on communities, we're not just talking about the individuals and their records. We're talking about growing up in a community that was underinvested. We're talking about growing up with a parent who was in prison. We're talking about just being perceived to be from one of those neighborhoods and the impact that that has. So we want to make sure that we that we address that. Cool. <laughs> Windows is not genuine. That is not a warning you ever want to get. You just don't get those on a pack of products. <laughs> yes, okay. So this is where we stand today. 2015, we brought the medical cannabis program online. Uh, we have not, we're not a great state for patients. Uh, we have one of the most restrictive access points for patients for medical cannabis. We have the, the smallest and most restrictive number of conditions. And uh, until last year, we actually fingerprinted and did background checks on patients as if uh, cancer did a background check on you before it invaded your body. Um, but uh, what we do have in the medical cannabis program uh, is a really robust uh, regulatory system that is the envy of the nation. We have zero leakage. Uh, we, have, we have folks coming in from around the country every week to tour our facilities and talk to our regulators about how we built this program. And so this, this sets us up with a really solid foundation uh, to build the adult program on. When we do, um, when we've done uh, talks about public safety and talks with law enforcement, um, even those who aren't happy with the idea of, of passage of this bill, they do acknowledge that they see product on the streets from all over the country, leakage from other programs. But when they talk to their colleagues around the country and around the region, our product isn't showing up on the streets because we've done such a good job um, on the regulatory side. Uh, in July of 2016, we, um, we attacked the fact that there were a lot of communities that had ticket uh, ordinances in place where uh, law enforcement had the option of either arrest or um, issuance of a ticket for low level possession. What we found when we did a survey um, was well north of 200 different ordinances, ordinances. And quite frankly, at some point we stopped counting because there's not a centralized repository of county and local ordinances. Um, but they ranged from a $5 ticket to a $1,000 ticket. The quantities ranged from, you know, you know, a couple ounces or a couple grams to ounces. Um, and so what we did was, was put in place a uniform civil enforcement uh, uh, system for the state of Illinois that took away that discretion. 
uh, low level possession of 10 grams or less was a, was a civil ticket that upon payment was expunged. So we also dealt with those collateral consequences that can follow people. Uh, and then last year, we expanded the medical cannabis program to cover, uh, to create a, a, another pilot program called the Alternatives to Opioids Act. Knowing that opioids are a product that can, for which addiction can set in within days, knowing that our medical cannabis program had wait times of well over 100 days to get a card, we wanted to put in place an option for patients who don't want to take that risk. Um, and so we created a, a path by which a doctor could certify a patient uh, for temporary uh, short-term access rather than uh, taking an opioid prescription, whether that's because you're concerned about addiction or, like me, can't tolerate them. Um, you know, there are lots of reasons why you might choose to, to take that temporary access, but that went online in January of this year. So what you see here is a um, early stage grow room and one of our cultivators. Um, every plant is tagged with a with a barcode, and I didn't bring it with me, but I have a package that I usually bring uh, hand around so you can see uh, how we how we um, handle the the product in Illinois. Um, what we do is track that product that plant from seed to sale, so that we know who's touched it, what it's been treated with what the test results were when it went to the quality control lab. So we, we can test for contaminants, we can test for, um, for potency and have it labeled accurately. And if ever there's an issue, we can have a recall very quickly and easily. Um, and when you see the, and the, there'll be a label in a minute, but um, you, when you, what you'll see is, you know, just like on any other product that you purchase, you, you get to see what the plant's been treated with. You get to see what it was tested for and, that it, and, and how it was certified. Um, we have uh, so 21, although only 20 of them are operational uh, cultivation centers. Most of them are in Southern Illinois. There are a couple, in, a couple up this way, but the way the <coughs> medical program was designed with massive setbacks, it's, it, it's a little hard to have a grow of this size in a, in a densely populated area because I'm not gonna lie, doesn't matter how much you like the smell of pot, they stink, <laughs> they just do. Um, and so, you know, at that scale, it's, it's hard to put them in densely populated areas. Um, there are 60 uh, medical cannabis dispensaries, uh, but only uh, 55 of them are operational. There are five licenses that were never issued. Um, there are, you know, it's a mix of, you know, some of the national entities that are operating in multiple states uh, and independent operators, both at the, at the cultivation level and at the dispensary level, but those are the only licenses uh, currently under the program, and we envision some expansion of the licensing categories uh, for, for, frankly, for the purposes of diversification of the industry, because it's, there's virtually no minority representation in, in our industry, very, very little. So what's going to be in the bill? What's in the old bill and what's the, what the new bill is going to look like? Did it again. Is there something I should do every time I do this? Call it. Just close. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so Illinois residents 21 and over can, can purchase and possess up to 30 grams. Non-residents are li limited to 15 grams. That's pretty standard around the country in states that have legalized. You, you, in terms of leakage, you don't want uh, folks to have too much to take with. We do have uh, home grow contemplated in this bill. Um, adults, again, 21 and over, uh, up to five plants per household. Like I said, by comparison, uh, 12 plants in Michigan. A lot of times people talk about the, the nightmares of home grow in Colorado. The beauty of our experience, our very first hearing, we had folks from other states come in and ask, that. We've, we've done this over and over again. We did it in that first meeting and every time we talk to someone from another state, we ask, what do you wish you had done differently? What do you wish you hadn't done at all? What do you wish you had been able to do? The home grow was an area that they had a lot of wishes around. Um, again, the difference between a referendum state and a legislative state the right to grow cannabis is enshrined in the Constitution of the state of Colorado. It makes it very difficult to regulate. But what they had also was the ability to proxy your grow rights to someone else. So I'm gonna pick on my friend here in the front row. He has the proxy for everyone in this room in Colorado. He has a warehouse. Law enforcement can't tell if you're real or your gray market 
or what you are. So when we hear about the nightmare of home grow in Colorado, it really went around the, this, this large number. It was five plants per person, or six plants per person, no matter how big your household was. So how do you define a household? And you could proxy that grow to someone else. Um, so, so this is much more narrowly construed. It's five plants, and you will be required to register with the Department of Agriculture as a grower. Uh, public consumption remains illegal, including DUI, and that's something that we addressed when we did the ticket bill. There was no uh, contemplation in Illinois law around um, DUI related to cannabis. Um, so we, working with the Prosecutors Association and law enforcement, put in some standards. Um, they are in line with what Colorado and Oregon and Washington do. This is an area of uh, a lot of uh, discussion because science hasn't caught up. There's not really a 0.08 equivalent. This is as close as we know right now. But just as it took us many, many years to get to 0.08, this will, this, isn't gonna, this will be an area of continued work. Um, we, uh, I mentioned the setback requirements in the, in the, uh, with regard to the cultivation centers. The, the medical bill has really, really strictly defined, you've gotta be this far from you know, schools, parks, churches, daycare centers, things like that. Um, but frankly, 150 feet in my neighborhood is very different than 150 feet here you know, and so we, we, we actually felt that it would be better and, and frankly better for the communities to be able to define their own setbacks. Um, uh, one great example of this is uh, with regard to dispensary locations. I, I represent, live in probably the, one of the most liberal neighborhoods in the state. I, I doesn't feel like hyper, hyperbole to say this. <laughs> Senator Bush just kind of gave me the, oh yeah. Um, but there were only two pieces of property that met the, the setback descriptions uh, in the in the bill. So the guy got the license, he got possession of, a, of, of one of the two pieces of property that, that could have met the setbacks, and by the time he got possession of the property, a daycare center had moved in across the street and he had to start all over again. Uh, so so we, we really want to return a lot of the power to the locals in terms of defining those things. Uh, and that includes being able to, um, you know, make sure that you're going, you're, your local officials are able to go in and do health and safety inspections and that kind of stuff. And that also means locals can opt out altogether. So here is this label I was talking about. So we, we maintain that exists in the, in the medical cannabis program that employers and landlords can still have a zero tolerance policy. That's an area we get a lot of questions about. Um, there are competing cases working their way through the court systems around the country uh, in terms of whether a patient has a right to consume cannabis and whether, whether an employer can or can't say that they can't. Uh, right now, we're maintaining that, and that's something that the courts are going to sort out. Um, and in terms of landlords or building owners or condo associations, I get that a lot. I have a lot of condos in my area, so they want to know, could they be, yeah, you can be smoke-free, you can be pet-free, you can be cannabis-free. Uh, there are very strict rules about packaging and advertising. Labeling is about safety, and we're actually going to improve upon it, again, based on what we've learned along the way. Um, so you see a label here that has, um, you know, Tells you what the when it, when it was tested, who tested it, when it was packaged, how much is there. You've got the name of the the the, the strain. This is that this is the um, barcode that I told you about that will take you from the very beginning all the way to to the end user. Uh, we've seen some labels now add things like time to activation, so we get questions around uh, edibles. That's that's something that requires a lot of public education. Putting that right on the label. Ensuring, and again, this was part of the meeting today, ensuring that there are warnings on there about using machinery, pregnant women, youth use, that kind of stuff. So we'll expand that labeling a bit. So lots of people talk about the, um, the money that's going to come from this. Now I will say, and I've said it a million times, if you do this for the money, you're going to end up with less money. If you start from a place of making it about bringing in, you know, treating it like a magic ATM, you're going to end up with less. Uh, states that have um, gone about it that way have ended up with a stronger illicit market and less tax revenue. So one of the pieces that will go into play here is ensuring that while there will be an option for a local tax, uh, there will be a cap on that so that, that, we, that we don't end up with, with that situation. We, uh, on one of our first trips out to Colorado, we met with the Boulder County District Attorney. He uh, told us a cautionary tale that we've carried with us to this day. 
his community, relatively affluent, not a lot of financial pressures there. They didn't add a local tax. Their uh, illicit market all but disappeared. In neighboring Pueblo County, a community with a, with a lot of challenges and a lot of fiscal pressures, they maxed out. They put as much of a local tax on there as they thought that they could bear. Their illicit market grew. So being mindful of that, I actually, when I meet with, uh, with groups of local officials, I caution to wait. Wait a year before you even contemplate putting a, putting a tax in place because there will be a share of the sales tax and all of that. There will be money coming to the locals even before you get to any local tax. Um, most other states, especially the early states, have gone back and revisited their taxing structure and reduced their taxes. Um, so in November of 2018, the Illinois Economic Policy Institute, which is a nonpartisan agnostic uh, in terms of their, their position on legalization, issued a report on what sort of impact uh, the legal sale of cannabis is likely to have. Their estimate is $525 million in new tax revenue. So you know, earlier on, there were some estimates, $350 to $700 million. Put a pin in it at around 520, and that, that's, that's about right. They've also talked about 24,000 new jobs will be created and 2,600 new businesses. Um, right now, there are about 2,000 employees statewide uh, in terms of people who are licensed to touch the plant. Um, but then you also have ancillary businesses. We did a, an economic development uh, hearing and did a whole panel on ancillary businesses. Um, and that's you know the guy whose family business for decades has been providing CO2 to soda fountains, who now provides the CO2 to the extractors around the state. His business has you know more than doubled in size as a result of that. Ditto with an accountant who talks about you know his family accounting firm has always been had always been agriculture based, and uh, he he brought on one cannabis client who told two friends who told two friends, and now he's the accountant to to a lot of the. The, the cannabis businesses, and, and he sort of jokingly said, you know, his, his cannabis clients are the most compliant he, of, of his clients. He doesn't worry about them cheating on their taxes. They, they, they're they are, uh, way more uh, compliant than his uh, regular ag clients. That said, there will be money, and people want to know where it's going to be spent. And so we talk about it. First and foremost, and this is the very first thing that was said in our very first hearing by the very first regulator in Colorado who put the, the program together, if you don't adequately fund your regulatory model, everything else will collapse. And so that's really important. We've, I've bragged on our regulatory system. We have to grow it appropriately. These guys are, are inspected every week. They can't <coughs> throw out their trash without it being inspected for, for seepage. So if we want to keep it that way, and we do, we have to grow it appropriately. So first and foremost, off the top, making sure that we, that we continue to invest in the regulatory model. Then from there, we want to make sure that, as I talked about, that public education component is robust, science-based, uh, evidence-based, and, and pushed out in a way that people will take it in. Um, mental health and substance abuse treatment is stuff that, those are things that we have really shortchanged badly for years. So this is an appropriate place to shore that system up. Uh, again, talking about the, the restorative justice component, we wanna make sure that we are in reinvesting in communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Uh, and then we've got some issues around making sure that law enforcement have the tools they need around that, that DUI. Uh, when we did the, uh, the ticket bill and we talked about you know, putting that standard in place, one of the things they wanted was, was some new technology that allows for roadside testing you can do a cheek swab and, and get a THC level. Um, unfortunately, it's pretty expensive. Our intent was for the funds from the statewide ticket to go to, to fund that. Most locals were smart enough to align their, their local ticket with, with the state law so that they can continue to use their, their, state, their local ticket. So not a lot of statewide tickets have been issued. So we wanna make sure we, we have that, that money for training and for equipment around DUI. Um, So this says no changes to existing DUI laws. There is one actually that we wanna make sure that we do do, which is uh, if you refuse to blow when you get pulled over for an alcohol related DUI, there's an automatic suspension. We wanna make sure that we align that if you refuse to participate in testing, um, if, the, if the suspicion is around cannabis. Um, so 
So one of the things that comes up a lot, the rules around transport, um, it has to be in a closed container. So you go to the dispensary and you get it in a container that, that actually is also smell proof. Um, so you can't have, just like you can't have an open container of alcohol in your vehicle, you can't have an open container of, of cannabis in your vehicle. That exists now under the medical, as it applies to medical patients, that'll be expanded. Um, so making sure that, uh, that, that that's very clear. And frankly, the, the odor is um, sufficient uh, probable cause for a search in other states. We've seen that. And then into the restorative justice area, we want to make sure that folks who have carried records that may have prevented them from getting work, getting housing, getting access to education, that we can expunge those records. In other states, what we've seen um, are efforts to make it easier to expunge records. What we found is people don't take advantage of it. You see about 1% uh, participation. Uh, we want to make sure it's as close to automatic as is possible. I use that caveat because we have, uh, uh, you know, as many uh, systems as we have counties. And you know that goes from fully automated to moldy boxes and warehouses uh, and everything in between. We're working with an organization called Code for America that actually got it under control in California so that they were able to do some automatic expungement there. So Code for America has uh, offered to come in and help us here as well. Uh, State's Attorney Fox in Cook County is actually doing it prior to the bill uh, even being introduced. She started the process in Cook County, which is gonna help us uh, work the kinks out on that process as we move through. Um, so we want to make sure, as we talk about uh, restorative justice, that we are addressing that issue of a lack of diversity in the industry now. So one of the ways we're going to do that is to create new avenues for entry into the industry. As I said, we right now have only two uh, licensing levels. You're either a cultivator, which means you grow it, you do the extraction, you create the infused products, and you do the transportation, everything under one roof. And the, or you're a retailer, a dispensary. So what we want to do is create that opportunity uh, in, in, within that, that cultivation space for other operators to be able to get in. We've envisioned a craft cultivator, which is a smaller footprint um, and potentially something that could be done in a more densely populated area without the, the, the issues of, of neighborhood impact, um, which you know, in, in our mind is, is uh, a, a great opportunity for economic development in some of, the, some of these more depressed communities you imagine, you know, we all know that we all see these around us, these uh, shuttered manufacturing facilities. These could be great opportunities there. We want to add a processor license. Under the current system, unless you are in with the cultivator, it doesn't matter how good your brownies are, you can't get them to market. We want to make sure that people who have a great product idea have that opportunity. Um, and then we're going to add a transport license. Some of this is about um, you know, entrepreneurship. Some of this is about access to, to the industry. Right now, in order to build a cultivation center, it's somewhere between 10 and $12 million up front. Uh, to build a dispensary, it's between one and $2 million. So some of these, uh, these other layers of licensing are about lower barriers to entry to make sure that mo more folks can, can participate. Um, and then fund fundamentally, uh, you know, to, to, uh, we want to reinvest in those communities through the Restoring Our Communities program. We want this to be community driven. We want this to be defined by the folks who, who can say what their communities need. Uh, we don't want to be uh, dictating that from on high. Everybody in, in Colorado, there was, uh, everybody got a new school building, whether they needed one or not, because it was so narrowly defined in, in, in the bill. So we want to make sure we're doing this in a thoughtful way. Of course, I did what I always do. I didn't keep going forward. So, so the, the expungement is anyone with a class four felony or misdemeanor violation. So those are pretty low level. Um, and then right now, you cannot work in the industry if you have any background. Uh, and so we want to take, that, take that, that barrier away as well. These are the, the other layers. I get, I get carried away and just start talking. Within the licensing structure and within the need to diversify the industry, we are talking about other ways to make sure that we do a good job of diversifying the industry. Um, no state's gotten this right yet. We want to be the ones. Um, and I think no state's gotten it right because for the most part, they've looked at it as a singular problem and sought a singular solution. And the reality is just like nobody in this room is the same, folks trying to get into this industry 
don't face the same barriers. You may have an issue of access to capital. You may have an issue of, of, of a criminal background. You may have an issue of skill set. You may need to, to be mentored or incubated. So we want to make sure that we create that buffet of solutions so that we get it right and make sure that all of the licensed applicants, regardless of whether they represent a, a disenfranchised community or not, are actually reinvesting in their communities and, and, and put in place within their license application a community benefits program that is enforceable. Right now, one of the things that we've got, uh, one of the problems with our current program, kind of two problems, um, is a lack of transparency and a lack of enforcement around these issues. Uh, there was a desire at the beginning in the, in the writing of the medical bill to protect proprietary information during the competitive portion of the program. So, you know, if you, if you, you know, if the two of us are applying for, for medical cannabis licenses, I might want to see your application and one up you somewhere. So they, they, they tried to shield that from public release. Unfortunately, they left that shield in place. So now we can't, you can't FOIA who owns the licenses within the industry. So we want to we want to lift that shield so there's more transparency within within the industry. But we also want to make sure that you know they all had to have a diversity plan too, but nobody has gone back and, and done anything enforceable around those. So we want to make sure there's real teeth in these. <laughs> and this is the the restoring our communities program. Um, and as I mentioned, there is an opt-out for locals, but if you opt out, you opt out of the benefits as well. So next steps, and then we'll get to your questions, which is always the most fun part. We have been, as I mentioned, you know, meeting, doing stakeholder meetings around the state. Uh, the governor uh, and his staff have now convened a few negotiating sessions. We've got uh, several more to go. Uh, we are hopeful that by the end of the month, there will be a new bill to, to release um, that reflects not just the, the work of the last two years, but also the input from these negotiating sessions. Um, I want to make sure that as we do this, we have, a, we have a thoughtful and realistic rollout plan so that we, we can get through the rulemaking process and get folks up and running in a timely fashion, making sure that we have the right tax strategy for our state. Uh, again, as I said, this is not about the money. Um, but we have to be smart about how we do it. Um, and then, you know, that allocation and distribution of revenue is, is probably the last thing, and that's the thing that most people are super interested in. Uh, that, that's where I feel like I should have a deli number machine um, for, for folks' questions. And with that, um, this is, if you want to stay uh, plugged in and keep uh, get updates, uh, follow the Coalition for a Safer Illinois. Uh, that is the, the coalition behind the bill, and they push out information about events like this um, and any information that's uh, forthcoming about the bill. Um, similarly, I'm at Rep. Kelly Cassidy on Twitter. Feel free to, to, to get me as well. And with that, let's see. Anyone else have questions? Please pass them over and thank you. Thanks very much, Representative. Really, really appreciate it. So I'm just going to go through these. Here. Any one of these? I need some cards. I, need, I have lots of questions. Yeah. Any more We're cards? We're trying to do one for constituents just so we get through them or I can bring some more cards. See if we can have a power. I'm happy to come back. Okay. Um, so uh, this is from uh, Gwent McGelvin, Grays Lake. Will the retail structure and licensing structure be similar to that of Colorado? Governor Pritzker spoke of making $170 million annually from licensing, which seems to indicate very expensive retail licenses. No. So Colorado basically had no cap on licenses, um, and, and that's, that's led to some areas being way over saturated and some areas with none. Um, one of the only things we have in the bill is a minimum distance between facilities because you don't want that liquor store in every corner experience. Uh, but there will be a cap on licenses in Illinois and it'll be determined by, by demand. And in terms of the license fees, that's not been set, but that's one of the other pieces in, term, in, the, um, in the equity applicant portion, there'll be fee relief uh, available. Okay, this is up from Hal Coxon from Haynesville. What provisions are under consideration for providing legal financial services so the cannabis industry can transition from a cash business 
to a more normal financial services environment? Well, that would be about banking. It is about banking. I, I went into this not expecting to come to understand as much about banking as I now do. Um, but most of this is federal, and there is federal legislation making its way through. There was a hearing last week um, in the House Financial Services Committee on the SAFE Act uh, that, that is intended to ensure that, uh, that states that have moved towards a legal marketplace uh, that, they, that, they, uh, that their industry can be banked. Uh, here in Illinois, um, prior to um, uh, former Attorney General Sessions coming in, about 85% of the industry was banked by a single bank. Um, as Sessions came in and did a little saber rattling, uh, they, they got out of the business. Most of these guys are now, are now cash. A lot of them have built other banking relationships. There's language in our bill that mirrors the SAFE Act, and State Tre Treasurer Frerix has bills moving through separately to create some other safe space for banking to, to do everything we can under state law, but we're limited. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Mimi Biscus, your name. Um, is there a legal limit such as 0.08 for alcohol, alcohol for cannabis? And you answered that. You may have yeah, so there, it, there is. It's, um, let me go back and get it right because I do it wrong. It's about the nanograms per deciliter of THC in your system. It is imperfect because THC is a more, um, five nanograms per uh, deciliter of blood, 10 per saliva. Um, and frankly, that's still gonna get you some false positives because the, the substance stays in your system. It's better than what we had before, which was zero tolerance. Um, so, so what we used to have, and frankly, that didn't work for anyone. Uh, law enforcement didn't like it either because it was very, very easy to get out of a cannabis DUI because all you had to do was present evidence that it could stay in your system and then you have reasonable doubt. Okay. Mia, Mitch, excuse me, bienvenue, Grace Lake. Uh, studies show links between cannabis use and increased incidence of mental health excuse me, mental illness such as schizophrenia, what will be done to deal with this problem? So the reality of that study is that it doesn't, cause, it, cause, correlation is not causality. Um, and so there, we don't, we could get you studies on every side of everything. What we do know in that schizophrenia study is that these are folks who, who use at such a level that um, most humans couldn't survive, frankly. It's, it reminds me of the, the tab and rats study from the 70s. Um, where you know saccharine killed rats, but yes, that's because you pumped it into their body nonstop. Um, and then there's the question of you know does it, do you, are you predisposed to this anyway? That said, ensuring that we're investing in our mental health system, ensuring that we have a robust public education system that talks about all of these things. Here's the thing with all of these questions, with the questions of of this or of DUI, as we talked about, 730,000, and we think that's a conservative number. 730,000 people in Illinois are regularly using this product. All of these things are happening today, but they're happening with an unregulated, untested product that is funding uh, the, the cartels and the, the gangs, in, in my community anyway, and we are pretending that this is gonna happen because we legalize. That's not real. It's happening now. We need to face it head on and do it in the right way. Prohibition hasn't worked. Okay, uh, Barbara. Sorry, I'm gonna butcher this one. Do you need to yeah. I'm sorry if I just can't read it well. Um, have, how can usage rates stay the same if your own study shows legalization would increase demand beyond current supply? Consider the alcohol and vaping are also illegal for youth, and yet these are some of the most used drugs among, among teens. So the, the, that's apples and oranges. The, the question of our demand study was about how much is being produced by the current industry relative to the, the medical patient base. Um, so the, the demand contemplates the people that are using on the illegal market moving into the legal marketplace. I think this is a continuation of the other one, but where are you getting your data about youth rates um, not increasing after legalization? We've actually seen this in multiple states. Um, we've used the, the we've used federal studies. We've used peer-reviewed university studies as well. Colorado has a really, really robust youth use study that they've invested in heavily. Um, that uh, that is also peer-reviewed. So, um, really, just more of the same question, but um, higher youth rates, increased traffic fatalities, um, increased black market activity, higher social costs, um, and uh, further marginalization of, 
underserved communities? I think it's just kind of the same question. So again, back to you know everything that it, every possible sky is falling story is happening today. We're just not taking care of it in a thoughtful way. Um, the, the questions around DUI rates and that kind of stuff, there are there are competing studies on that. Again, the reality is we don't have um, we don't have a, an honest approach to it today. It's happening today. We're not handling it well. A lot of times, a lot of the newer, a lot of the studies that come out, very often we get cited the Rocky Mountain Haida study out of Colorado. Um, that's been debunked re repeatedly. A lot of what they did was, um, and this is something the folks in Colorado told us to, to be sure to do, count before legalization so that you have accurate comparisons after legalization. So a lot of the, the citations in the, in, in the Rocky Mountain Haida study refer to um, you know, a 500% increase in this or a 400% increase in that. If you dig into the numbers and you look, it was zero because they didn't count it the year before and they got five the year after. So you really have to, to be pretty cautious at, when citing studies. And you know, I'm just gonna let you all know that after, if we've gotten an email address from you, I don't know if we're getting those, um, if we have, or maybe we can post it somewhere, just access to a variety of different studies. So Yeah, we've got a lot of that check. we can share, happily. So you can check for information. And a Wilson from Antioch. Um, if legalized in Illinois, will legal adult use take place before it is available commercially? No. Can we limit Big Pharma from taking over if they haven't already? And this is from <laughs> Kathleen from Grizzly. Lake. And that's something we've spent a lot of time on. Um, one of the one of the ways that we that we are looking to do that is to incentivize local ownership, um, because that's something that that we that that we are mindful of. Um, that said, we are a capitalist society, and people sell their licenses, and there is consolidation. There always will be, but we do want to make sure that we are doing everything in our power to to incentivize and protect small business owners in this. Okay, so this is um, from Ian Abernathy, Round Lake Beach. Uh, what will be done to ensure all retail facilities understand how to properly implement all rules? For example, in California, some dispensaries require customers to sign a register, others do not. So California is like the worst possible example. Every time somebody comes to me and says, well, California has got this going on, the reality is California is attempting to back into regulation, which is a lot like getting the toothpaste back into the tube. We have a, a, a great gift in, in, our, um, in our program that uh, it, it's working. We've got uh, you know, folks that are well-trained, adding training recommendations, um, not unlike the, um, the things that bartenders have to go, the trainings that bar bartenders have to go through. So we're, we're adding that to this as it expands. So um, this is from Julie Gardner. Is this a bipartisan effort? Do you think you have the votes to get this passed? It has been bipartisan from day one. Uh, we've got uh, support from both parties in both chambers. Um, this has been uh, really just, a, it's been a great experience, quite frankly. A lot of times, in, you know, people talk about why oh, this is happening really quickly. In Springfield, as, as you've witnessed, things can, really, really big bills can pop out of nowhere and suddenly be passed. That's not what this is. You know, as I mentioned, we introduced this bill first in March of 2017. We have traveled all over the state. I'm very close to killing a car over this bill um, it, because we want to make sure that we're doing this in the most deliberate way possible. And I can certainly attest to that. Um, I think it's so important that we go slowly, that we learn from other states. And, and, and really, I, my colleague, uh, Senator Heather Staines, who is carrying the bill of the Senate, is not able to be here tonight. And I can tell you, she's a very measured legislator, as is Representative Cassidy. And we will, I, I'm gonna make sure that everything is done um, in addition to. You have a lot of legislators that are really interested in this process and it's been long and arduous. And I think there's more to be done. But anyway, some states have been uh, better than others in generating revenue. Uh, what are they doing to maximize and what would we do to maximize revenues? So I think the most important thing is to ensure that you are moving folks out of your street market and into your legal market. And you do that by going slow. You do that by not overtaxing. You do that by making sure that there is access available. Um, when you're, you know, right now we have some of the highest prices in the country in our medical program because there are so few patients. 
as that grows, and it's growing as we speak through the opioid um, alternative program, that's going to help. Um, but you want to make sure that we don't uh, put ourselves in a position of taxing ourselves out of business. Thank you. This is from Gary Oldman, Gurney. There are better ways to administer uh, CBD uh, than a joint or a brownie. Uh, are we making provisions for more precise and convenient ways to use drugs for delivery uh, devices such as they have in California? So that's where we get to that processor license so that we can have that kind of innovation available in the marketplace. Thanks. So this is from Brian uh, Moran, like Villa. Will there be opportunity for grow and retail businesses under the same business? No. Um, so a craft, there is contemplation of tasting rooms in craft, but that hasn't been decided yet. Um, but, but right now, uh, there are, there, there's no true vertical integration. Um, there are growers who own dispensaries as well, but they are separate separate entities. Okay. Uh, Lou Frank Grizzly, define minority owned and define craft grower. So craft grow is um, a smaller canopy, frankly. So that number is kind of uh, still in flux as we do some study. Uh, the 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 reality is you want to make sure that um, it's it's big enough to be a sustainable business and small enough not to require automation, so that you you have to end up doing that $12 million investment. So from what we've, what we've learned, that's somewhere between five and 12,000 square feet under canopy uh, is, is what, what craft looks like. Defined minority, uh, that, that's defined under state law, uh, the WBE, MBE, uh, and that includes veterans. So women, uh, people of color, and veterans is, is, tends to be what that, those programs focus on. Okay, so this, the first part of this has already been asked, it's about banking, but the second part, transportation of product once purchased, um, it's, is it supposed to be locked up? It is supposed to be locked up. As a patient, I currently use THC, CBD, transdermal patches. How will law enforcement handle medical? That's not gonna change from the way it is now. So, um, you, you know, folks that, that get, if you get pulled over and you've got a patch, you give your card and deal with it then, but that we're not touching that. Charles from Highwood. Um, how are healthcare professionals being engaged in crafting cannabis-related policy in Illinois? Um, expanding medical indications, uh, recreational legalization considerations, et cetera. So the medical program is a separate bill altogether. That's actually a pilot program that needs the sunset lifted. Uh, and uh, Representative Bob Morgan is working on that. We're working together on both things as there is sort of a Venn diagram of our lives. Um, but uh, we are looking at restoring the board as one of the possibilities. There was a, there was a board that contemplated <laughs> new conditions. So he, he is looking at those pieces. Um, and has, has the medical community been involved? Yes, I worked very closely with uh, the State Medical Society on the opioid pro bill last year. And in fact, they were, they were here today in one of our, our sessions uh, talking about uh, the public health considerations. Okay, and I'm gonna do my best on this. Um, on Illinois cannabis labels, I think I may have seen milligram amounts of CBD and THC rather than percent. If I'm correct, then does the milligram strength listed apply to the whole product versus a smaller serving size? Like serving sizes found on food packages, label, labels in grocery stores. So on edibles, they do have to have a serving size. I'm trying to go back to one of the labels, but this wasn't for an edible. Um, so edibles require a serving size uh, to be marked, and and you have to be able to certify that the that each serving size has the same amount of product in it. I'm not sure if that's really the question you're trying to get answered, but I'm seeing if I can go back to the label. But like I said, this won't be a, a this is not an edible label. This is a. Uh, and I believe here in Illinois, we actually require edibles to be um, individually wrapped. Some states, you can, like there's a candy bar and they have to be scored, but I think all, all of them in Illinois have to be wrapped. Um, so this one has percentage, um, and I think it's required to be percentage. I'm not certain though. Uh, so I, this, it sounds like a hyper-specific question that I might need to see an example to be able to help you with. So if we have time after, maybe it's whoever asked the question can come up and ask. Testing the fluids for THC. Does that always reflect recent use? 
such that the impaired driving might be attributed to cannabis. My understanding is that cannabis may be detected for several weeks. So does this testing discern recent use? No, it doesn't. And frankly, like I said, it's better than it was because we had zero tolerance if you had anything in your system at all. This is as close to uh, good as we have yet, um, but this, this is an evolving area of research. Uh, Lawrence uh, from Grace Lake. Is some money from, in, uh, from the income going into research related to cannabis use? That's an open question because of the issues around federal law. Uh, when we went out to Colorado, they dedicated a fairly significant chunk to their university systems for research, and they can't touch it because of their licensure issues at the federal level. So we, had a, we, we, we are having these conversations. We can really only do um, probably social science kind of research in terms of tracking and, and impacts, but in terms of sort of the, the actual you know, medical science stuff, that remains challenging. Israel is actually doing some of the best research. Uh, they, they've, been, um, they've been really on the forefront on that. Okay, this is from Elena in Lake Villa. Um, this has been a sad week for Illinois State Troopers, I'll say truly tragic. A second trooper died last week, hit by a driver, knowing that in states that have legalized marijuana, fatal car crashes have gone up 200%. What will Illinois do to prevent drug driving? Do you have studies that show the 200%? Is that an accurate number for you? No, um, actually it's not. But again, there are, you know, these, there are studies that tell you a lot of things. Um, so we have, uh, we, we've tried to, you know, get uh, as, as good as we can get on this. There's limited pre-legalization data, and that's that's one of the things that challenges the studies. Um, uh, the the there is a difference sometimes in these statistics. There's a difference between an incident caused by THC and an incident involving THC. Um, a 2017 study published in the American Journal of Public Health compared motor vehicle related fatalities in Washington and Colorado to eight similar states, and found that three years after legalization, rates were not statistically different than those in comparable non-legalized states. So we again, we don't have great data on that. That said, we are um, really mindful of the issues around this. Again, it's happening at today. We need to make sure that we're putting the training into drug recognition experts. We need to make sure we're putting the, 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 the efforts and resources into enforcement. I actually am the chair of the Appropriations Public Safety Committee, and on my way here was having a conversation about making sure that um, we, we actually have the staffing required. I mean, this is really a manning issue on the, on the trooper side. Um, we've gone years where we've only um, added like one cadet class uh, during, the, during the four year budget debacle, um, rather than a usual year, which is two to three new trooper classes. Uh, we've done one, sometimes none. And so they, there's just not the enforcement available in particular around Scott's Law. So we're actually gonna do a hearing probably next week um, on, on the Manning issue. Great. Okay, could legalization in Illinois help with the expansion of standardization of CBD oil? And is this being considered when discussing the legalization? So no, CBD, uh, we actually did the hemp bill last year that's working its way through the rules process um, for hemp-derived uh, hemp CBD, so that's a, a separate okay. issue. And this is from Lawrence again from Grace Lake. Uh, in the law, are you considering allowing smoking marijuana in public? No. That will remain illegal. Jonathan from Grace Lake. Similar to how alcohol is talked about in high school health ed, what would a cannabis education program look like for our young people? So I talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, and, you know, I can do the analogy about the eggs in the pan again. But you know, I think that it has to be. You know, I, I mean, I've got teenagers. You know, if I if I'm if I'm trying to slip one by them, they know it, and they lose respect for me. And so, being honest with my kids, and I mean, my kids get the conversation about neuroreceptors and addiction pathways, um, and they understand. And I think if you give kids fact-based information, they can actually make decent decisions. And as I mentioned, Colorado has a pretty robust and, and really interesting. A youth education program that's both school-based and you know public education based uh, that, that's a great example to look at okay. uh, this is from John Wasick Grace Lake will the law fund addiction and rehab services if so how will we support county health services 
aside from a Lake County board member. <laughs> so, so yes is the answer, um, and we were just talking about that today. It will probably go through the same path that um, those funds go through now, which is DHS grant funded programs. Uh, we just want to beef those up and make sure that we're getting them back up where they used to be um, and, and make sure that the money gets pushed out appropriately. And this is from Joyce Latz and Gurney. Would usage be restricted to inside your own house, i.e., uh, could you be sitting at a picnic um, in your car or, or, or uh, in your car and using? No, public use, oh, just like open containers, uh, same thing. Uh, public use is prohibited. Uh, some states and some communities have contemplated uh, what they're calling social use spaces. Um, that's something that nobody's really gotten right yet. Uh, but, you know, given that it, we still have issues of disproportionate impact and disproportionate policing on public use uh, in communities of color, that's something worth contemplating, finding a way to even maybe allow locals to contemplate social use spaces. Like we have cigar clubs and that kind of stuff. So that's, that's what some areas are contemplating. Okay, so uh, we don't have any more written questions. So I have a couple more, if you don't mind. Uh, so do you expect that we're going to see this bill called this legislative session? I hope so. That's the plan. Okay. I just wanted to hear. Yeah. Okay. I'm a psychologist. I'm a member of the Illinois Psychological Association. Great. And I talked to Dr. Terrence Kohler, our legislative liaison. He says he's seen nothing, would like to see something on this because we would definitely comment. And I'm just saying, it doesn't make sense to me. You're going to bring it through soon, and they haven't seen it or looked at it. We'll reach out. Thank you. Appreciate that. So I can answer that. Okay, so the legislative session goes from January to the end of May, basically. So you, if it's introduced this year, I would guess it may be sometime in April or May. Um, but definitely the, the plan is for April. The plan is for April. Can I make a comment? Of course. It's not a question. Sure. Um, it's been a while, and things have changed with the marijuana itself being stronger. But in uh, from 2008 to uh, 2011, I worked in an inpatient treatment center for women. In two years, there was one person who had an addiction so strong to marijuana. This is experiential. You know, I'm not talking, and I worked with them closely every day. Yeah. And not but one person was in there <coughs> two years, daily basis, worked with women every day. I don't condone use, I don't think it's harmless. I we but I mean we in two years that's a pretty solid yeah. and none of us think it's harmless. Yeah. But prohibition hasn't worked. Um, and, and you're right. So you know in the, the, the top ten most addictive substances in the world, they're all legal in some way shape or form right so so you know the reality is we are none of us say that it's non-addictive um everything can be addictive it doesn't it's not addictive in the same way as as an opioid or or or, or, or some other drugs but um anything like i'm right there are psych, it becomes a psychological addiction um that said we're not dealing with it we're not we're not investing in it we're not we're not attacking it head on and and it is it's you know Alcohol, sugar, caffeine. Yeah. A woman, a woman was in there eight times for alcohol. Yeah. Eight yeah. times yeah. she went in treatment. So, so I just want to say, we weren't going to allow this at all, but you're such a good group. I mean, truly, <laughs> when, you have, when you have a group of people on a subject that can really polarize people, uh, you really don't know that everyone's going to behave. Uh, and that sounds <laughs> terrible, but true. Um, so we are going to obviously, we went through all the cards and asked all of those questions, but we do have a little bit more time. So I'm going to walk around and allow you to ask questions, and um, I'm just going to come down there now. Hope you don't mind, Representative. Not at all. I'm Not really proud all. of this district. I think you guys are <laughs> awesome. And this is why, truly, I'm just I'm really thrilled to be able to bring, bring this here. I mean, there are people that tell you don't do these things, really. Um, I believe you have a right and, and to Dr. understand if you, and ask could, I, If I give you my email address, will you email me, email, me, email me contact information for the person you reference? It's repcassidy at gmail.com, and we will reach out to him. Yes, and you can reach out to our office if for some reason that just bounces back. Who knows? 
Um, I'd like to revisit the question about schizophrenia. It wasn't my question, but um, it hits me personally because my childhood best friend from two years old through college um, had a, a psychotic episode triggered through marijuana, triggered schizophrenia, which I realized is if you have a predisposition for it. But with all due fairness, there are more than just one study linking the two together. And just this month, or last month, it's April now, so in March, there was a study from The Lancet right. that, that said that high potency marijuana does increase the risk of first episode psychosis and later risk for psychotic, psychotic disorder. So are you planning a cap on THC potency? Because that was just a 10% cap that they saw. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's something we're, we're exploring what other states have done around that and how you do that and make sure that patients who have higher need still have access. Um, but that is something that we that we talked about today. Um, to to that study, though, it, the study itself actually said they, they can't fully link them. We can't say that it's cause, cause that there's causality there, even in, in in that exact study. And good news on another subject: we passed some legislation that allows for earlier diagnosis, also and treatment for uh, young people. I'm going to grab the next person. Right there. starting high school and I've, I've talked to her about it and just she's learned everything she needs to know and it was really well done so you know, is Illinois going to follow kind of the suit this way? That, that's my desire yes okay. and that's exactly what we're looking at the language they use to define uh, because you know you don't laws don't contain like the program itself so you, you look at the language that enabled it that got you to the rules that created that got you to the program itself but we've provided the program itself to our Department of Public Health. And I think it was the funding also Absolutely, and we want to make sure that we do that. So I am. Uh, I'm Seems the, to have a little delay on it or something. <laughs> I'm the uh, director of the Small Business Development Center right here at College of Lake County, and so uh, we are partially funded at the federal level through the SBA, and then at the state level through the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. So it's still illegal at the federal level and i'm anticipating a time when i'm going to have people knocking on my door saying i want to start a pot shop or whatever and i can't help them at this point and so i'm just saying we're going to need some guidance around that issue at the state level in terms of how we deal with that so it's really just a request on my when, when i left the deputy governor's office this morning he was getting on the phone with the illinois finance authority to, to, to walk through that stuff. Ways that we can make sure that that support is available in a way that doesn't jeopardize local fund, locals with their federal funds. We're very mindful of that. Thank you. Back here. Hi, so this is a comment and a question. Um, you mentioned the, the eggs in the frying pan thing. I think that was a campaign that came out I think it was the 80s, but yeah. Okay. So I think you really dismissed a lot of the good prevention efforts that have gone on since that campaign. No, that um, has nothing to do with dismissing it. It's really talking about that comparison of, you know, hyperbole versus fact. And I'm not saying that, that the other prevention efforts weren't good. I'm talking about the need for a, a, a robust prevention effort. That's all. Right. And I totally agree. And I think a lot of that has happened. And we've seen a lot of great results, even here in Lake County on how, you know, if you look at the youth, Illinois Youth Survey, that um, perception of marijuana had gone down, use of marijuana rates had gone down, cigarette smoking was way down. Um, so I, I guess I, help me understand why you think that legalizing this drug would make any of that better. Because I, I think the prevention efforts are working and they are based, based on truth, like you said, not on scare tactics, like remember Reaper Madness and all that. I mean, it's that, we know that doesn't work. And that's not what people are using here. Um, we also know that prohibition doesn't work. I mean, it's really that simple. We're, we are not preventing people from, and I'm not talking about use only. I, I'm talking in, in general, we've got 780,000 people accessing this product on the illicit marketplace. It's really that simple. Prohibition has failed. And we can do better. But to the to go the opposite way and legalize it, I just wonder, have you all considered stuff in between? That's what I guess my question is. 
Right, it's legal for 21 and above, and you know, making sure that it's in a, a tested and regulated, I mean, there, there, there really isn't an in-between. Either you buy it from the dude slinging weed on my corner, or you buy it in a regulated space. There's not an in-between. I kind of agree with her, though. I, 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 I don't think legalizing a drug that is an introductory drug to so many other harder core drugs is the answer. Prohibition is um, not necessarily work. If you make a law that says you can't do something, I mean, if you have a law at your house, you tell your daughter, you know, you can't have any more dessert for the rest of the week. What's she thinking about all week long? having dessert and if you're not if your back is turned and she can sneak a cookie out of the cabinet she's going to do it that's what kids do that's what we do if you go on a diet what are you thinking about all day food what you want to eat what are you going to eat at the next for your next meal and what you'd really like to eat so you can't tell me that prohibition is the problem a problem is our own human nature that wants what we're told we can't have and we shouldn't have. So I, my concern <coughs> is, is the issue with our young teenagers. So can I just having, say this? Yeah. I'm gonna interrupt you. Yeah. I'm gonna ask you to ask a question. Okay, so I'm just gonna ask a question. How is it that we're going to protect teenagers from uh, taking this now legalized drug that you're proposing and using it when we can't protect the teenagers from the now illegal alcohol that they're now using. So teenagers actually report, 87% of teenagers report that cannabis is easier to get than alcohol. Because Absolutely. you don't get, the guy on my corner doesn't card. And the guy on my corner, you know what else he does? He upsells. He wants you to buy the more expensive, more addictive drugs. The gateway is the dealer. I want to take the dealer out of the system. It has happened in, in every state that's seen it. Colorado's street market has reduced by 75%. Thank you. Actually, that's not true. In, in illegal Someone else has the microphone. You know, remember how I said you guys are great? <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I, I understand your point, and you can make that. Right. But what I want to be clear, as long as we're asking questions, I'll let the mic be passed. The minute we start lecturing someone or start attacking someone, questions are done. Mm -hmm. This is an information forum, and I hope you'll respect that. I respect your opinions, and you are welcome to email me, you are welcome to call me, but that is not what tonight is. Tonight is an informational town hall for you to get questions answered, develop your opinions, decide whether you <coughs> believe it's the right thing to do or not, and certainly reach out to your elected officials. And if I am your state senator, reach out to me. I'm happy to hear your opinions. But that's what we're going to keep doing. So go ahead. I'd like to say oh. I have about three minutes' time. Mm -hmm. I never deal from me. Well, I'd I love to know what deal. email address you're using. Uh, I'm using whatever is uh, given to the senator for the question. Okay. Well, then if that's the case, we'll talk after. I, I should mention to everyone just a point of information. On your agenda, uh, if you flip over your agenda, on the bottom of that agenda, you should see an email address and a phone number. Anybody who has questions that don't get answered tonight are welcome to reach out to our district office. You'll have that email address and that phone number. And if that's the case, I'm happy to find out and get back to you. I apologize if that happened. Uh, my question was, with the research that you did, with you talked through with the other states um, in regard to the communities and minorities and uh, not None of the states actually getting it done correctly. Uh, what have you learned or what recommendations have they given you for the rollout in the sense of recreation? So that's where we really came to this recognition that it's not a singular problem with a singular solution. So making sure that, so for example, Oakland, California, uh, so California, as I said, it's a little bit of a mess there, so we don't, it's not a great set of examples, but Oakland did a really interesting program around incubation, access to capital. Um, they tried to do the wraparound services. It wasn't fully baked into the statewide system. It was outside of the regulatory system. It was done by, by two women running a not-for-profit who had a brilliant idea, but not a lot of resources to get it done. So it really, you have to, it has to be baked in from the start. 
And most importantly, we can't start from a place of inequity. We want to correct for that before we even roll out. You uh, listed four categories that you're going to use that are going to be funded by this, uh, four specific um, mental, health mental health, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, some of us are old enough to remember when the toll boys were going to be paid for. Education, yeah, from the lottery. How, how ironclad is that? And if it were um, moderated, would you withdraw your support of this bill? So we we now see when we do new programs, there's there's the no back door uh, language that goes in. So so we do want to make sure that we protect for that. There's no sweeps of the funds so that it can't get taken to other places. The lessons have been learned. Hopefully they can get implemented in a thoughtful way. Not many people that old. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? Which state agency is intended to oversee the marketing of glyphosate before we go ahead with this? So the question for anyone who couldn't hear him, he's asking which state agency is intended to do the oversight, the licensing, all of those pieces. Right now, it's actually spread out among agencies. The, the um, cultivators are uh, overseen by ag. The retailers are overseen by the Department of Financial and Professional Regulation. The patient system is overseen by the Department of Public Health. We foresee keeping that in place and creating an Office of Cannabis Control or some other name that's more of a coordinating air traffic control system to make sure that as it grows, they're actually, uh, that, that, they're, that their coordination is, is grows organically. So, so there will be, the, the regulatory system we intend to stay in place, but, but build supports into it. And of course, the Department of Revenue will now have a role with the tax committee. Oh, did you have your hand up there, Frank? Sorry about that. I want to say, too, that, um, you know, certainly we've had some questions that we have passed on from people that have sent information um, and questions to, to my office. We've passed them on. One of the things I, t I can tell you, uh, Lake County has already reached out, certainly through me, and I sent the information on to Representative Kelly and to uh, Senator Staines to talk about making sure that there is mental health funding, that we make sure that the counties are able to you know, get that funding so that they can deal with addiction issues uh, in a better way. So we just pass that information along when we get it. So if you have really specific ideas about things that you think can improve the program or that you believe need to be included um, when and if we do legalize adult use of cannabis in the state of Illinois, forward those things on. These are serious ideas that you have and thoughts that you believe that you've seen in other states, heard in other states. Please forward those things. Anything that is, you know, if you're serious about wanting to make this better legislation, send those ideas and we will be happy to pass them on. And we are happy to have them, frankly. I mean, I talk about this as the no bad ideas portion of the program, right? We're, we're if, if you have an idea for how to make this better, this is our opportunity to, to really take a leading role in, this, in the country. Thank you. You guys have an awesome senator, by the way. She's one of my favorite people.